CP is caused by most times deprivation of oxygen and that often happens at birth where it takes too long to get a child out and the longer they're without oxygen the more their brain cells are killed and the less function they have. So for me the team of doctors that delivered me had never delivered a child before and they should never have been in that position. Secondary school made me, in the sense that it was such a bad time, my character had to evolve to what I was facing, which is why the home situation was so difficult for me, because school life was also so difficult for me. I was bullied every day for five years, and I was also excluded from sport for five years because I had a disability. Names that would evolve out of that, retard, spastic, you get beat up because you physically couldn't keep up with people. It just, it was more damaging than, than good. I was told I would fail my exams and I never quite felt welcome there, even by the teachers. It wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, we've got DDS now at university, disability service. It was special educational needs. I started athletics properly when I was at uni and a lot of my confidence has evolved through sport. By the time I'd got to uni, my character was more formed. So I wasn't as much, I wasn't so concerned about what other people thought of me. Even though I was still timid and shy, I had an inward self-confidence that I hadn't had before. And when I came to uni, it was a decision made solely by me because no one else in my family had ever been to university before. So it was, it was a journey that I had to take by myself. And it was one that I decided that whatever happens, I'm gonna make good of it because it's something that I want. I guess I really started coaching in 2004, seriously. And uh, I've been, Ryan, we've been working together for almost two years. So I've done, I've done quite a lot of work. I was full time at Brunel with UK Athletics um, as a performance coach, but also relays team manager and national event coach for juniors, sprints like that, and things like that. So I was doing lots of team stuff, lots of coaching like that. Coaching, you, 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 once you've developed your philosophy and you've got a system that works, you just tweak it every year. You tweak it and you tweak it. I've coached over 45 athletes now and, and I've coached at every level. And it, it was a new challenge. It was like, you know, this skinny guy walks into Brunel and no one's paying him any attention and he makes a beeline for me and he gets right in my face and he says, are you Harry King? I said, yes, and he puts his sh shakes my hand and he says, I want to be a sprinter. He said, I've got CP. I said, okay, what's that? And so we had a little chat and I said, wow. I said, I don't know anything about it. He said, well, I do. I don't know how you coach it. And I said, well, nor do I. And he said, will you coach me? And I just thought I went quiet for a minute. And I said, Ryan, I'm not going to teach, I'm not going to treat you differently. It's a hell of a challenge, and I like a challenge, so yeah. And then within a couple of weeks, he's telling me, King, I want to go to the Olympics. When you think about how far we've come from where we started, you could have said no. Yeah, because it was an impossible situation. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, you're like, no chance. And that's the thing, I tell this story nearly every week to children in schools. Yeah. And every time I tell it, I still get response because it's still so crazy. Well, because we started off, we couldn't stand on one foot. Mm. We talk about run 100 metres. Well, even the first or, meeting, I wasn't even sure how to approach it. How do you talk to someone <laughs> who's the head coach of yeah. university who's coach Olympic athletes? You You're telling that person that you want to go to the Olympics, but you've never run before in your life. Yeah, it was a bit mad. I read all his medical notes, twice, and we spoke hours. And then it was, for me, it was like, well, I know the movement patterns I'm after, you can't actually do them. 
So we started off on a balance ball for weeks and I was just to see just to see whether he would improve because they are some some of these people, medical people will tell you, you've got CP and they're treated like they're sick. And he never ever wanted to be treated like that. So I think it was the pride and the desire in him and that drive that I want to do this. And his story just inspired me and I thought, yeah, I'm gonna give you a crack and see whether I can make a difference. So there's no books on coaching CP, especially a sprinter. Um, so we just made stuff up between us, which worked and within three months, he was at World Juniors. When I first started training, I didn't always listen, not in the wrong way, but if everyone else is doing 10 reps, I'll probably do 20. Or if you're doing 10 on the right side, I would then do 15 on the left side because I saw myself with certain weaknesses and I knew what I needed to do to change that. He wants to be Ryan and that's why we work well together because for me, he's just, he's just a man with, he just moves a bit differently. And then for me, I've, well, I've got to try and make the way he moves work. You know, so I don't, I don't treat him if he's, he's got some kind of ailment or some affliction. You know, we just, we just work with what we've got. So no, I don't think, I think it's better. He's around able-bodied guys, and I can tell you from the day, from the first session, he was doing more, always did more than everybody. He's first in the gym and last out. And that's never changed. And he's inspired the other guys, the able-bodied, to train harder. But for me as a coach, it, it means I freshen up my philosophy and yeah, I've had to tweak the way I coach slightly with him because I have to look at his learning style. So I have to get under his skin and know how does he, does he need to feel what he's doing? Does he need to see me do it first? You know, how does he, how does he learn? So yeah, there's, there's lots to it. The reality is I wake up and go to sleep every day in pain. I've been on this earth for 20 years. I don't remember a day in my life I haven't been in pain, which is why I'm a good athlete, because the pain from training doesn't even compare to the pain that I'm in daily from my condition. That's why I can push through when able-bodied people around me start dropping like flies, because my mental strength is, is so much stronger. When you've got to haul yourself out of bed, um, completing a set is nothing. When, I, when I'm running, I feel free. Um, despite all the aches and pains and physical limitations I might have, when I'm just on the track in general or, you know, just training, I'm a much different character. I'm a lot more at ease because I'm doing something that I love. Growing up, the family was together and then there was a split and the boys went to live with dad. I stayed with mum for a while. As the eldest son, I put it as my responsibility. And my dad always told me that if anything happens where he's not there, then I'm to look after mum. I went to move with my dad because the year that I spent with my mum was very bad for my own physical and mental health. During the year that my brother spent away with my dad and it was just my mum and myself, things got progressively worse and our relationship got progressively worse. I got anorexic and very ill, so I packed my bag, no clothes, my few little prized possessions, not that I had a lot, and left home. I hadn't spoken to my dad in the year that we'd been apart because mum had been saying this and the other and the relationship was fragmented. I didn't have anywhere to go and I didn't know what to do. So I called him and I didn't know what to say because we hadn't spoken in so long. It's funny, you know, the other day I was saying to my girlfriend, it's going to be nine years this year since I left home and nine years that I haven't had a relationship with my mum. My mum is alive, but there's nothing there. 
she's still very much very sick. Um, her physical health has deteriorated to the point where she's physically disabled now. The life she lives is not one that I can be a part of anymore. If I see her, I see her. If I don't, I don't. Sounds harsh, but you never move forward. Yes, yes, I did. Don't lie, you did. I absolutely would say that. I was, I was not. I, I thought Paralympic was a waste of time. You know, why should they get the same funding? All of those things. If I, if I'd have looked at myself ten years ago, when I was at Brunel, running, and that was a high performance center, elite center. I was, I had a totally different attitude then. I honestly couldn't give a shit what condition you've got because I'm not looking at you as a disabled person. And this is, this is the whole thing behind what I'm doing, enabled, not disabled, is removing disabled from the equation. It don't matter what you've got. All I need to know is what you want to achieve and how I can help you get there. And the whole thing about enabled, not disabled is not about making people Paralympians. Yeah. It's saying, okay, you've got this thing in your life, which is labelled as disability, but, I'm not bothered by it, and the people around you shouldn't be bothered by it either. As a society, what can we do to help you? What's your aspiration? It's my responsibility to help you get there. With indoor running, we're running on a 60 metre track with 15, 20 metre run out. And I'm coming through the line, dipping through the line, at 23 miles an hour and trying to stop in 15 meters. So, and you, then you're running up the back track. So if you run lots of indoor races, you're putting sheer force through the base of your back. When we run in full flight running, just sprinting, we're putting up to seven times your body weight through your leg. So imagine the force I'm putting through my back when I'm trying to break and stop. So. 1982, 1981, 82, I ran all over the world and on some very bad tracks. I ran on some tracks in America where they catch you in a rope because there wasn't enough run out. I've been over the barriers. So to run really fast, you have to forget it's 60 meters and just run to run really fast. So um, I just started getting a really bad backache. No one could find out what it was. Went to European Championships as one of the favourites. And um, back just let me down totally. The final, I couldn't run. Legs started to shake in the blocks. I had a whole nerve thing going on in my back. And and I, I think I was fifth in the final, something like that. It's sad sometimes, for me, but it's difficult for me to watch. Because I see someone who loves physical activity and more and more they can't do it and it's deteriorating him because sport was such a big part of his life and I can see how it's scaring him. It was uh, a very long operation and they put two screws, so I'm screwed together, bionic man now, and I've never had a problem with my back. You know, I don't I hardly get any, if I don't work out, I get, I get pretty bad. The height of my career, I've run 10.25 in America. Um, I made my name in indoor running and ran almost unbeaten indoors. So I was like, uh, I got up to about fourth in the world and British record, Commonwealth record, that kind of stuff. I'm the first person to say he's not just my coach. Having someone you can be completely honest with is incredible. And I think you're very lucky if, if you have someone where you can sit down, you can say something to them and you know they're going to tell you the truth. I've had three athletes before Ryan that would tell me the truth. Three or four athletes before him. Um, all the guys, that the, the, the alumni, the people that have left uni and come back and are still there, they tell me the truth. And one of them will actually say to me, King, that was a terrible session. I'll say, what for you? He said, no, for you. You didn't coach that very well. You know, and I like that, that honesty that he will, we will argue about stuff, and it's good. It's whether, it's whether you as a coach can sit in the chair and listen to that and take it constructively or whether you're going to take it the other way.
he's he's kind of family now. You know, he's 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 not. I, I always see it. You know, I create a family with the people I coach. But he's he's a bit he's a bit different. You know, I've had that. He's not the first one I've been like that with Andre and Harvey and Tunde. That you know, you know I've had people George, Georgina and, and Gemma. They, these people are special, but he's a bit bit more than that. A bit more. We're a bit tighter than that. Yeah, we talk about some deep stuff and we kind of share common bonds. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen to him, but I know whatever happens, I'm going to be there to support him as he has supported me. And at the end of the day, he's had a good time with the sport. And I think when time comes for him to hang off his boots, as they say, he'll be able to smile and say, I, I enjoyed it. It wasn't always easy, but I enjoyed it. And that's something he's instilled in me, to always try and be content with what, you've, what you're doing. Because track and field is cruel. It's, it's, it's a sport that you give your life to, and more times than none, you get nothing back in return. Yeah, there's, there's things in him that I, I, I would generally want to see him do, fulfill his life goal. He's got some goals set that are really tough and I would never tell him he can't get there. And I think that, I've said this to him, you're the person you are because of CP. Yeah. Friend, <laughs> coach, mentor, advisor, so family, shoulder to cry on, the list goes on, you know, yeah. but the answer is no, I haven't had anybody like that before. Yeah, yeah. And no, there won't ever be someone like that again either. I don't know how long I can do this for. So I have to make the most out of it while I can because the reality is I could wake up tomorrow and my legs don't work. If that does happen, I honestly don't know how I'd feel. But I don't want to sit there and say, well, I didn't work as hard as I could have done. Or I didn't achieve what I wanted to in the time I had. So I have like some very simplistic rituals that get me through the day sometimes. I wake up in the morning, draw my curtains, and I wiggle my toes. And if I can wiggle my toes, then that's a good day. But there was a time I couldn't do that. So when I can wiggle my toes, I know I can get out of bed. That means I can go and train. So every day I can train, I have to train. Even if I don't want to, even if I'm tired. Even if I've driven 500 miles of work and been up 17 hours, I'm still gonna go do the session because it's what I love to do.